Um, you know, the, the other night I went out, my wife and I and our kids, we went out with some other families, some friends of ours, and uh, we were celebrating one of the kids' birthday parties, and, and we were out there, and we were having this good time, and, and to, but towards the end of the night, you know, the kids were kind of melting down, and we're trying to get them home, and you have to understand, a lot of, a lot of these people I've known for over a decade, 12, 13 years, we went to college together, we went to this Christian university, Oral Roberts University together, and, and we sat in, in many of these same chapel services where we had speakers tell us, you know, that you are going to do great things for God, you know. And we would sit around and talk about all the things that we were, God was going to do through us and through our generation and all the vision we had and all the dreams that we had. And a couple nights ago when we were out with all of our kids, there was this moment where... <laughs> Toward the end of the night where the kids are melting down and we're grabbing diaper bags and grabbing the two-year-old on the other hand, looking for the five-year-old's hand, and there's flip-flops on the floor and sippy cups on the floor, and they're making a mess of this restaurant that we've just been in. And I swear, there was a moment where I looked and we caught eyes. A couple of our friends, we just kind of looked at each other as if to say, what have we become? <laughs> you know? Like, what happened? How, how did we grow up, you know? And, 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 you know, we used to have God-sized dreams. You ever heard sermons like that? Like, you got to have a God-sized dream. Now we have grocery lists, you know? We have God-sized dreams. And you start to feel like, okay, what, what, what happened here? Is this, are we selling out? Is this, did we, did we settle? Are we missing God? And our culture actually sort of reinforces that because our culture tells us that life should always be exciting and life should always be interesting and life should be an adventure. And look, if you're stuck in a rut, we have all these bad words for a rut is a bad word and anything that's a routine is a bad word. If, if my goodness, if your week looked like going to work and coming home and eating dinner with your family, then that's just lousy. That's not good enough. That's not exciting. And so our culture, even, even the secular culture, we think about commercials that are always trying to sell us on, hey, what you need to break out of the mundane is a vacation to Disney World, you know? Or, or, or what you really need is this getaway or that getaway. Or, or sometimes the movies we watch or the books we read, it's like, oh, here's this person caught in an ordinary life and then <gasps> finds love somewhere else, whether it's outside their marriage or not. And so we're kind of sent this message that a new love affair is what we need. And that's what is going to help us bring the excitement and the adventure back. And so we say things in our culture like, yeah, well, you know, I mean, this, this marriage or this relationship, it wasn't really taking care of me. And I really lost who I was. And I needed to find out who I am. And this person really makes me feel alive. And so we're just drawn to the things that make us feel alive. And the new moral code is whatever makes you feel alive. I saw a commercial the other day that said, hey, instead of buying a new TV, sitting, sitting on the couch all day, why don't you buy a Jeep? I thought, wow, how did they do that? They just upsold you by about $15,000, you know? It's like, well, you could spend 500 bucks on a TV, but no, buy a Jeep Wrangler, you know? And I was like, ooh, that's kind of, ooh, that's interesting, you know? Exciting, adventurous. And as Christians, I think we have our own version of that. We have this... We have this notion that when you sign up to follow Jesus, that everything's going to be an adventure, that everything's going to be spectacular, that miracles are going to happen all the time, and we're going to walk into the grocery store and go like this, and cabbage will land in our cart, you know, and like, we can just, it's just going to be amazing, like, this is the, this is what it means, man, we're spiritual people, you know, we can live this extraordinary life, and and I love miracles and I love the miraculous, but sometimes I wonder if we want those things because we're fixated on the fantastic. Because what we really want is just another high and another rush and something else. Come on, give me something fantastic. Is it surprising to know that even in the pages of Scripture, what you would call the miraculous was not common everyday stuff? If you were to plot out on a timeline when all the miracles happened in Scripture, you would see a handful throughout the timeline, but then it, it, it takes about 2,500 years, and then there's, there's this guy named Moses. And around Moses is a whole bunch of miracles leading Israel out of Egypt and into the Promised Land. There's a whole bunch of miracles. And then it kind of tapers down. 
In fact, when they were in the wilderness, if they wanted to eat, stuff just dropped out of the sky, literally. If they wanted to drink, water came gushing out of a rock. Wow! Can you imagine what the promised land is going to be if the wilderness is this good? Well, guess what? When they got to the promised land, if they wanted to eat, what did they have to do? Plant stuff. Raise livestock. And if they wanted to drink, what would happen? Oh, I don't know, dig a well. Wait a second, what happened to all the miracles? And actually, between Moses and the next density of miracles, Elijah, is 600 years. Roughly 600 years between all of these, woo, Moses miracles, and you have to wait a long time more before you get to Elijah. And then there's fire from heaven, and you're like, woo hoo hoo And then there's this long period of silence again, and you actually have to wait another 900 years or so before you get to Jesus. Which may be why on the Mount of Transfiguration, who's there with Jesus? Moses and Elijah. These were, in the the Jewish mindset, these were the two great prophets of the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, and so they're connecting Jesus with them. But even Jesus spends 30 years of his life just sort of being a carpenter and doing normal stuff. You're like, okay, listen, if I was God incarnate, if I was going to finally put skin on and come to earth, I would not sit around for 30 years. We got work to do. Let's go. Let's come on. Let's zap people. Let's do stuff. Let's like abracadabra over things. Let's like make magic happen. Let's make it spectacular. And yet more than 90% of Jesus' time on earth is what we would say is rather unspectacular. And it makes me wonder what we're going to do with all this. Because are we perpetuating our adolescence by being consumed or obsessed with the dramatic? 